learners, today we are going to analyze a poem written by Rupert Schoner Brook titled The Soldier. His middle name sometimes was given as Chaucer. He was born on 3rd August 1887 and made an exit from this mortal world at a very young age and died on 23rd April 1915. He was an English poet known for his idealistic war sonnets written during the First World War. The most popular one was The Soldier. He was also known for his handsome looks which were said to have prompted the Irish poet W. B. Yeats to describe him as the handsomest young man in England. Brooke was born at 5 Hillmorton Road, Rugby in Warwickshire. His father, William Parker Brooke, was a rugby schoolmaster and mother was Ruth Mary Brooke, knee cotterill. Brooke was the second of the three sons and he was educated at two independent schools in rugby. The first one was Hillbrow School and second one was Rugby School. While travelling in Europe, he wrote a thesis titled John Webster and the Elizabethan Drama which helped him to bag scholarship from the King's College, Cambridge, where he became a member of Cambridge Apostles and was also elected as president of the Cambridge University Fabian Society. He helped Marlowe Society Drama Club and acted in plays including the Cambridge Greek play. Brooke befriended the Bloomsbury group of writers, some of whom appreciated his talent while others were impressed by his good looks. Virginia Woolf bragged to Rita Sacquilly, west of once going skinny, dipping with Brooke in a moonlit pool when they were in Cambridge together. Brooke had a strong association with another literary group known as the Georgian Poets and was one of the most important of the Dymock poets associated with Gloucestershire village of Dymock, where he spent some time before the war. He also lived in the old vicarage Grand Chester. Brooke endured a severe emotional crisis in 1912 caused by sexual confusion and envy resulting in the failure of his long relationship with Ka Cox, that is Catherine Laird Cox, Brooke's mistrust that Lytton Strachey had an evil plan to destroy his relationship with Cox by encouraging her to see Henry Lamp hurried his break with his Bloomsbury group friends and played a part in his nervous breakdown and frequent visits to Germany for treatment. As part of his recovery, Brooke toured the United States and Canada to write travel diaries for the Westminster Gazette. He took the long way home, sailing across the Pacific and staying some months in the South Seas. Much later, it was discovered that he may have fathered a daughter with a Tahitian woman named Tata Mata, with whom he seems to have enjoyed his most complete emotional relationship. Many were mesmerized by his handsome looks and were smitten by him. Brooke was amorously involved with the actress Kathleen Nesbitt and was once engaged to Noel Olivier, whom he met when she was aged 15 at the Progressive Bedalus School. Brooke was a great source of inspiration to poet John Gillespie Maggie Jr., author of the poem High Flight. Maggie idolized Brooke and wrote a poem about him, Sonnet to Rupert Brooke. Maggie also won the same poetry prize at rugby school, which Brooke had won 34 years earlier. As a war poet, Brooke hogged the limelight in 1915 when the Times Literary Supplement quoted two of his five sonnets. 
fourth one the dead and five the soldier is full on march 11th and a sonnet 5 the soldier was read from the pulpit of saint paul's cathedral on easter sunday that was on 4th of april brooks most famous compilation of poetry which listed all five sonnets 1914 and other poems was first published in may 1915 and in tribute to his popularity ran to 11 further impressions that year and by june 1918 had reached its 24th impression a process undoubtedly energized through posthumous interest brooks accomplished poetry attracted many enthusiasts and followers and he was taken up by edward marsh who brought him to the attention of winston churchill then first lord of admiralty he was commissioned into the royal naval volunteer reserve as a temporary sub lieutenant shortly after his 27th birthday and took part in the royal navy division's antwerp expedition in october 1914 He sailed with the British Mediterranean Expeditionary Force on 28 February 1915 but developed sepsis from an infected mosquito bite. He died at 4:46 p.m. on 23rd April 1915 in a French hospital ship secured in a bay off the island of Skyros in the Aegean on his way to the landing at Gallipoli. As the expeditionary force had orders to depart immediately, he was buried at 11 p.m. in an olive grove on Skyros, Greece. The site was chosen by his close friend William Dennis Brown, who wrote of Brooke's death. The poem by Rupert Brooke, the soldier, begins by presenting the soldier's possible deaths. but the manner in which these poems discover death is not what we might expect indeed it is not so much a horrific death on the battlefield or in a trench a very common theme in much world war 1 poetry that preoccupies brook as it is the idyllic afterlife that soldiers will get to experience when they die to die in battle for one's country is dignified lofty and even honorable in brook's sonnets but especially so in his poem the soldier this poem was written in 1914 and is popular as a nationalist poem brimming with patriotic fervor it elevates the heroism of the english soldiers who fought in world war 1 the poem brings out a unique point that war is not always declared for the reasons that your government tells you there is a bigger canvas to consider and comprehend it's a popular literary piece that is read at memorial service of the soldiers in world war 1 it was at times difficult to identify the dead bodies of their comrades and perform proper funeral rites in france it was the same and the dead bodies were buried at national cemeteries and a huge space was dedicated to bury the body of the unknown soldiers who sacrificed their lives for the sake of their country with white crosses with their names on them though the crosses didn't necessarily match up with the bodies that were underneath them if i should die forever england well there are few lines in between that is lines from 1 to 3 the poet says that if he dies in battle his body will be buried on the foreign land and it is similar to the field that belongs to england because he belongs to england lines 3 to 4 there shall be dust concealed the land that he dies on is considered as pious as it conceals the soul of a great man who died for his country lines 5 to 8 a dust sons of home england 
as his birthplace, instilled life into the poet and chiseled his personality and gave him an identity. His thoughts and beliefs were deep rooted in him, based on the culture and the society of England. England taught him about love, loyalty and honour and also made him immortal because he fought for England. And think no less, that is lines 9 to 10. His death is fondly acknowledged because he sacrificed his life for England. His evil deeds do not come to light anymore because he did what was right. He gave up his life for his country. Gives somewhere happy as her day, lines 11 to 12. His death lets him to only remember the glorious part of England. It also loves for someone else to come and take his place. He enjoys the privilege of passing on all the dreams and thoughts that England taught him on to the next generation of soldiers, so that the next generation of soldiers might get inspired by his sacrifice and display the same patriotic fervor towards their country. Lines 13 to 14 and laughter under an English heaven. These final lines reveal the happiness that England has bestowed on him. And because he selflessly sacrificed his life for England, he will forever be at peace in heaven with only good thoughts and laughter in his heart, always full of happiness, laughter and good thoughts. The poem has 14 lines and the sonnet is subdivided into two groups. The first eight lines form the octave and the last six lines form the sestet. In general, the octave introduces a problem which is then resolved in the sestet. Technically, the ninth line of a sonnet or the first line of the sestet is called the turn or volta because this is where the poem usually starts to change gears. In the case of the poem The Soldier, for example, the first eight lines of the poem discusses the various situations which compels the soldier to embrace death and also highlights the role of England that has contributed to the development which led to his death. In the ninth line, the speaker imagines what it will be like in heaven and thus shifts or turns the direction of the poem away from the earth and towards an afterlife in the sky. When we try analyzing the poem structurally, that is the soldier, it is written in a metrical form called iambic pentameter, which is the most common meter in English poetry. Shakespeare's works are replete with such structures and the readers definitely run into this rhythm a time or two even if they fail to comprehend the structure in the first one or two readings. There are several sonnets available to understand their structure and master them. The structure of every line of iambic pentameter contains five. Pent is the prefix that means five iams. Now, an iam is a two syllable pair that consists of an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. For example, look at this line and think this heart all evil shed away. Now, not every line in the poem scans as perfectly as this one. Line 8 can be taken as an example, washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home. When we closely study this line, it begins with a stressed syllable rather than an unstressed syllable. In the poetry, a syllable pair that contains a stressed syllable followed by an unstressed syllable is called as trochi. It appears as if speaker really wants to emphasize that word washed. Small replacements like this are fairly common in poetry. Any time a pattern is established then broken. These breaks are intended to grab the reader's attention for emphasis or catch their ear as in this case.
The speaker or the narrator is intelligent enough to read the minds of the readers. The speaker of the poem The Soldier is the soldier himself. The poem is written in such a way that it unfolds the poet's mind or his psyche. The poet is a realist. The poem begins with a sentence, if I should die bears a hard fact. The reader already feels a cold hard truth that most people would rather not think about. The ordinary souls shudder even to think about the hard facts though they cannot evade them. The wisdom deserts them and at some point or the other they do not want to imagine that they will face death. As a soldier though the speaker is thrust face to face with his own mortality and so this poem is his way of working through that looming possibility. Historically for the poet that likelihood became a sad reality when he was off to participate in a war as a soldier and died of infection not long after this poem was written. After analyzing the poem, the reader automatically feels that the poet deserves the support of the readers for dealing with reality rather than shying away from it. We can also look at the poet as an idealist. A detailed study unfolds the poet's mind in an interesting way. His perspective of death is totally different from the common man's perspective. The way that the speaker faces the threat of death is hardly pragmatic. He envisages a kind of heaven that will be just like home, full of the same thoughts, sights, sounds and even dreams of his native land. This paints a picture of a speaker who appears a real patriot. Another interpretation can be his cheating his own self without being aware of it. He appears to be an idealist and paints a colorful world which is difficult to imagine and accept. Well, he is also a patriot. Another way to interpret the speaker's English heaven though is to understand it as a natural expression of his love for his country. It means the poet almost worships his motherland England. He rejoices his upbringing there, promises to claim more land for soldiers who lay down their lives in the war and portrays heaven as nothing more than or nothing less than different places and streets in England. In a nutshell, the poet tries to convey that England will continue to reign supreme both in terms of earthly contest and in terms of heavenly immortality. The patriotism is the main flavor of the poem that ultimately bind, blinds the speaker to the facts of imminent horrors of World War I. While we have to cut Brooke some slack for not being able to predict the outcome of the war when he wrote The Soldier, here the speaker is a great example of the kind of naive, overly romantic and patriotic thinking, a person of patriotic thinking who could send millions of people into armed conflict against each other. It is evident that the setting of this poem has England and the fervor of patriotism is everywhere. England from the speaker's past seems to be present everywhere. Its royal territory has spread its roots on earth and also in heaven. The speaker feels her presence everywhere. It appears as if the speaker cannot think or visualize anything beyond it. It is quite natural that for a dedicated soldier and a patriot, it is expected that home will occupy the topmost rung of the ladder of the priority list to appreciate and think about. What is really fascinating about this poem is the way the various forms and facets of England dominates the speaker's thoughts and takes over every possible setting, real and imagined. Every speck of England's land is adorable. The flowers, the rivers, the sun, breeze, they all together paint 
an adorable picture of England on the reader's mind and sees to it that the reader, like the soldier, is obsessed with England's beauty and splendor. For the soldier, though the setting is everything, it dominates his mind, body and the spirit. Almost all of them who met Rupert Brooke fell under the power of his captivating or charming personality and his spell lasts even today. In spite of all the well-deserved unfavorable criticism of his famous war sonnets, he still has many followers. There are two recent biographies of him. One was published in 1997 by Mike Ridd, Rupert Brooke. Life, Death and Myth by Nigel Jodes was published in October 1999 and a film about him is due out soon. Rupert Brooke Society was started on August 24th in the year 1999 to honor this great poet. Brooke's significance as a poet lies partly in the amazing success he enjoyed as a narrator for well-liked attitudes and beliefs in the starting months of the First World War. He worked as a great motivator for the soldiers who participated in the war. The self-sacrificing heroic gesture, which he articulated in such beautiful and unassuming terms, is still very pleasing. Unfortunately, his words should not be taken at face value. The heroism was a veil that hid the tragedy of his life. The extract from Minds at War gives a complete account of Rupert Brooke, including all his war sonnets and his contrastingly sober last poem, Soon to Die. It also has many extracts from letters which enlighten about the turbulent state of his mind in the last phase of his life. Both out in the dark and minds at war carry information about how Brooke was posthumously made into a hero by the establishment. He wasn't a war poet like Wilfred Owen or Siege Fried Sassoon. Soldiers faced bravely the horrors of war and affected their nation's conscience. Instead, Brooke's work, written in the initial phases of the war, when victory was still in sight, was full of joyful and positive friendship and idealism, even when impending death was looming large on him. The war sonnets swiftly were, became focal points for spreading the patriotic fervor and also to motivate the same through their promotion by the church and government. The soldier formed part of the 1915 Easter Day service in St. Paul's Cathedral. The narration gained a lot of popularity as it touched the hearts of people and also became the focal point of British religion. The poem depicted the image and ideals of a brave youth sacrificing young for his country were projected onto Brooke's tall, handsome stature and charismatic nature. While Brooke's literary works is, are often said to have either mirrored or affected the mood of the British public between late 1914 and 15, he was also and often still is disapproved of. For some, the idealism of the war sonnets is actually a chauvinistic glorification of war, a light-hearted approach to death which ignored the bloodshed and brutality. Such comments usually date from later in the war when the high death tolls and horrid nature of trench warfare become noticeable events which Brooke wasn't able to observe and become accustomed to. However, studies of Brooke's letters disclose that he certainly was aware of the distressed nature of some conflict and many have contemplated on the impact further time would have had as both his skill as a poet and the war itself developed. His lasting reputation. Although 
Few of his poems are considered popular when modern literature looks away from the World War I. There is a definite place for Brooke and his works from Grant Chester and Tahiti. He belongs to the elite class of Georgian poets whose verse style had markedly progressed from previous generations and as a man whose true masterpieces were still to come. Indeed, Brooke contributed to two volumes entitled Georgian Poetry in 1912. Nevertheless, his most famous lines will always be those opening lines of the poem The Soldier, the words still occupying an eternal place and position in military tributes and services today. Hope you also felt the patriotic fervor when the poem concluded. Thank you.